London is, is amazing along many dimensions, but it's also amazing in the incredible variability of the governments within this geography and their age too, right? So they're, they're ancient in a way that is mind-boggling, of course, to an American, right? That's absolutely right. I mean, if we go all the way back to the original unit of London government, which is the City of London, people all over the world have heard of the City of London. Square mile, right? The square is. mile which they'll associate often with financial and business services, rightly. But it's also an ancient unit of government, originally given a charter by King William I when he came to conquer England from Normandy back in 1066. So it has an unusually long history. And in fact, you can go back beyond that to the Romans, but just, this is modern history right. by British standards. So we start in 1066. And it's existed ever since. Now, what's interesting about this is, of course, because it's protected its boundaries because of its ancient rights and privileges, as the city sprawled outside, it didn't move the boundaries out. It fought to avoid that. And that meant that ad hoc, often church-based uh, units of government, parishes and so on, were set up outside. And over time, those were regularised into units, then bigger units, then bigger units. And from time to time, Parliament, when it thought infrastructure was needed, would clamp a city government on top of all of that. And that's why, even today, you've got a rather strong and fragmented second tier and a relatively weak upper tier. So we have William the Conqueror uh, giving these rights to the City of London. Who was there and why were they asking for rights and why was he giving them to them? Well, the City of London pre-existed William the Conqueror and what you'd got was really a collection of merchants inside the city, a very, very powerful mercantile culture uh, whose um, history is visible in the city today. And those groups of merchants, often in companies, generally actually in companies, had a form of demo relatively democratic government by the time and when uh, William the Conqueror arrived, the Normans took over Saxon England, he realised that the city of London was potentially a place to tax. Mm -hmm. And there was a deal to be done between the arriving monarch and the city of London and its uh, trades guilds. So that was the deal that was struck, really. So there's an upfront payment in exchange for these future liberties. Well, an ongoing payment, as it turned out. I mean, uh, monarchs for some time afterwards saw the city as a way of raising money. So an ongoing tax source in exchange for liberties. And of course, intriguingly, uh, William cited the Tower of London, which is not in the city, it's just on the edge, to keep an eye on the city. And equally, if you look at the city today, there are aspects of it which are slightly detached from not just London, not just the rest of London, but the Britain. So, for example, the police in London, a separate police force in the city of London, I should say, have um, helmets on their heads that don't have the royal insignia on them, very unusual by British police standards. And when the Queen, when the monarch goes ceremonially into the city, has to stop at the edge to be welcomed in by the Lord Mayor of London, that kind of thing. So you've got a, a sort of difference. Reflecting the ancient liberties of the town. Ancient liberties and ancient economic freedoms, which are still present in the cluster of towers and financial services, and indeed, you know, post-Brexit, the question of how all that survives today. So... Um, there are these companies of merchants, and they get a quasi-democratic form of government, meaning there are, there's voting, certainly, but it's almost more like the voting of a modern corporation than it is the voting of a modern town, right? And that it's not one man, one vote by any, by any means, right? It, and it's still not, right? No, it, it, it wasn't one, one man, one person, one man then, I'm sure, one, one person, one vote. And it, it was based on these powerful companies and guilds having a, a vote in the city's government, the city's finances, and eventually, after the 13th century, the Lord Mayor of London. Vastly more democratic than the world in, in, its, in its time. Indeed so, and quite progressive in its way. It was a trading place, so used to people coming in and out. You know, the docks uh, started really just on the edge of the city, moved downriver. So like all places, which are all cities that are open to the sea and open to international influences, we think about this uh, these days as the norm for a global city. But the city always had that about it and was curiously liberal in some ways as a result of it.